Ooze by Anthony M. Rudd. In the heart of a second-growth, piney woods jungle of southern Alabama, a region sparsely settled by backwoods blacks and ca- queer, half-wild people descended from Acadian exiles of the mid-18th century, stands a strange, enormous ruin. Interminable trailers of Cherokee Rose, white-laden during a single month of spring, have climbed the heights of its three remaining walls. Palmetto fans rise knee-high above the base. A dozen scattered live oaks, now belying their nomenclature because of choking tufts of gray, Spanish moss, and two-foot circlets of mistletoe parasite, which have stripped bare of foliage and gnarled, knotted limbs, lean fantastic beards against the crumbling brick. Immediately beyond, where the ground becomes soggier and lower, dropping away hopelessly into the tangle of dogwood, holly, poison sumac, and pitcher plants that is moccasin swamp. Undergrowth of titi and anis has formed a protecting wall, impenetrable to all save the furtive ones. Some few outcasts utilize the stinking depths of that sinister swamp, distilling shinny of pure con, liquor for illicit trade. Tradition states that this is the case, at least a tradition which antedates that of the premature ruin by many decades. I believe it, for during evenings intervening between investigations of the awesome spot, I was often approached as a possible customer by woodbillies who could not fathom how anyone dared venture near without plenteous fortification of liquid courage. I know, Shinny, therefore I did not purchase it for personal consumption. A dozen times I bought a quart or two, merely to establish credit among the Cajuns, pouring away the vile stuff immediately into the sodden ground. It seems that only through filtration and condensation of their dozens of weird tales regarding Daid House could I arrive at an understanding of the mystery and weight of horror hanging about the place. Certain it is that, out of all the superstitious cautioning, head-wagging, and whispered nonsensities, I obtained only two indisputable facts. The first was that no money and no supporting battery of ten-gauge shotguns loaded with chilled shot could induce either Cajun or Darkie of the region to approach within five hundred yards of that flowering wall. The second fact I shall dwell upon later. Perhaps it would be as well, as I am only a mouthpiece in this chronicle, to relate in brief why I came to Alabama on this mission. I am a scribbler of general fact articles, no fiction writer as was Lee Cranmer, though doubtless the confession is superfluous. Lee was my roommate during college days. I knew his family well, admiring John Corliss Cranmer even more than I admired the son and friend, and almost as much as Peggy Breed, whom Lee married. Peggy liked me, but that was all. I cherish sanctified memory of her for just that much, as no other woman before or since has granted this gangling dyspeptic even a hint of joyous and sorrowful intimacy. Work kept me to the city, Lee, on the other hand, coming of wealthy family and, from the first, earning from his short stories and novel royalties more than I rested from editorial coffers, needed no anchorage. He and Peggy honeymooned a four-month trip to Alaska, visited Honolulu the next winter, fished for salmon on Canes River, New Brunswick, and generally enjoyed the outdoors at all seasons. They kept an apartment in Wilmette, near Chicago. Yet during the few spring and fall seasons they were home, both preferred to rent a suite at one of the country clubs to which Lee belonged. I suppose they spent thrice or five times the amount Lee actually earned, yet for my part, I only honored that the two should find such great happiness in life and still accomplish artistic triumph. They were honest, zestful young Americans, the type, and pretty nearly the only type, two million dollars cannot spoil. John Corliss Cranmer, father of Lee, though as different from his boy as a microscope is different from a painting by Remington, was even further from being dollar-conscious. He lived in a world bounded only by the widening horizon of biological science, and his love for the two who would carry on that Cranmer name. Many a time, I used to wonder how it could be that as gentle, clean-souled, and lovable a gentleman as John Corliss Cranmer could have ventured so far into scientific research without attaining small-caliber atheism. Few do. He believed both in God and humankind. To accuse him of murdering his boy and the girl wife who he had come to be loved as the mother of baby Elsie, as well as blood and flesh of his own family, was a gruesome, terrible absurdity. Yes, even when John Corliss Cranmer was declared unmistakably insane. Lacking a relative in the world, 
baby Elsie was given to me and the middle-aged couple who had accompanied the three as servants about half of the known world. Elsie would be Peggy over again. I worshipped her, knowing that if my stewardship of her interest could make her a woman of Peggy's loveliness and worth, I should not have lived in vain. And at four, Elsie stretched out her arms to me after a vain attempt to jerk out the bobbed tail of Lord Dick, my tolerant old Airedale, and called me Papa. I felt a deep down choking. Yes, those strangely long black lashes someday might droop in fun or coquetry. But now baby Elsie had a wistful, trusting seriousness in depths of ultramarine eyes, that same seriousness which only Lee had brought to Peggy. Responsibility in one instant became double, that she might come to love me as more than foster parent was my dearest wish. Still, through selfishness I could not rob her of rightful heritage. She must know in after years. And the tale that I would tell her must not be the horrible suspicion which had been bandied about in common talk. I went to Alabama, leaving Elsie in the competent hands of Mrs. Daniels and her husband, who had helped care for her since birth. In my possession, prior to the trip, were the scant facts known to the authorities at the time of John Corliss Cranmer's escape and disappearance. They were incredible enough. For conducting biological research upon forms of protozoan life, John Corliss Cranmer had hit upon this region of Alabama near a great swamp teeming with microscopic organisms and situated in a semi-tropical belt where freezing weather rarely intruded to harden the bogs. The spot seemed ideal for this purpose. Through Mobile, he could secure supplies daily by truck. The isolation suited him, with only an octoroon man to act as chef, houseman, and valet for the times he entertained visitors. He brought down scientific apparatus, occupying temporary quarters in the village of Burdett's Corners while his woods house was in process of construction. By all accounts, the lodge, as he termed it, was a substantial affair of eight or nine rooms, built of logs and planed lumber bought at Oak Grove. Lee and Peggy were expected to spend a portion of each year with him. Quail, wild turkey, and deer abounded, which fact made such a vacation certain to please the pair. At other times, all save four rooms were closed. This was in 1907, the year of Lee's marriage, Six years later, when I came down, no sign of a house remained, except certain mangled and rotting timbers projected from viscid soil, or what seemed like soil, and a twelve-foot wall of brick had been built to enclose the house completely. One partition of this had fallen inward. I wasted weeks of time first, interviewing officials of the police department at Mobile, the town marshals and county sheriffs of Washington and Mobile counties, and officials of the psychopathic hospital from which Cranmer made his escape. In substance, the story was one of baseless homicidal mania. Cranmer, the elder, had been away until late fall, attending two scientific conferences in the north, and then going abroad to compare certain of his findings with those of a Dr. Gemmler of Prague University. Unfortunately, Gemmler was assassinated by a religious fanatic shortly afterward. The fanatic voiced virulent objection to all Mendelian research as blasphemous. This was his only defense. He was hanged. Search of Gemmler's notes and effects revealed nothing save an immense amount of laboratory data on karyokinesis, the process of chromosome arrangement occurring in first growing cells of higher animal embryos. Apparently, Cramner had hoped to develop some similarities or point out differences between hereditary factors occurring in lower forms of life and those half demonstrated in the cat and monkey. The authorities had found nothing that helped me. Cranmer had gone crazy. Was that not sufficient explanation? Perhaps it was for them, but not for me and Elsie. But to the slim basis of fact I was able to unearth. No one wondered when a fortnight passed without appearance of any person from the lodge. Why should anyone worry? A provision salesman in Mobile called up twice, but failed to complete the connection. He merely shrugged. The Cranmers had gone away somewhere on a trip. In a week, a month, a year, they would be back. Meanwhile, he lost commissions. But what of it? He had no responsibility for those queer nuts up there in the piney woods. Crazy? Of course. Why should any guy with millions to spend shut himself up among the Cajuns and draw microscoped and large notebook pictures of what the salesman called germs. A stir was aroused at the end of the fortnight, but the commotion confined itself to building circles. Twenty carloads of building brick 
50 bricklayers, and a quarter acre of fine meshed wire, the sort used for screening off pens of rodents and small marsupials in a zoological garden, were ordered. Damn expense! Hurry! By an unshaved, tattered man who identified himself with difficulty as John Corliss Cramner. He looked strange even then. A certified check for the total amount given in advance, and another check of absurd size slung toward a labor entrepreneur silenced objection, however. These millionaires were apt to be flighty. When they wanted something, they wanted it at tap of the bell. Well, why not drag down the big profits? A poorer man would have been jacked up in a day. Cranmer's fluid gold bathed him in immunity to criticism. The encircling wall was built and roofed with wire netting which drooped about the squat pitch of the lodge. Curious inquiries of workmen went unanswered until the final day. Then, Cranmer, a strange, intense apparition who showed himself more shabby than a quay derelict, assembled every man-jack of the workmen. In one hand he grasped a wad of blue slips, fifty-six of them. In the other he held a Luger automatic. I offer each man a thousand dollars for silence, he announced. As an alternative, death. You know little. Will all of you consent to swear upon your honor that nothing which has occurred here will be mentioned elsewhere? By this I mean absolute silence. You will not come back here to investigate anything. You will not tell your wives. You will not open your mouth even upon the witness stand in case you are called. My price is one thousand apiece. In case one of you betrays me, I give you my word that this man shall die. I am rich. I can hire men to do murder. Well, what do you say? The men glanced apprehensively about. The threatening Luger decided them. To a man, they accepted the blue slips, and, save for one witness who lost all sense of fear and morality in drink, none of the fifty-six has broken his pledge as far as I know. That one bricklayer died later in delirium tremens. They found him the first time, mouthing meaningless phrases concerning an amoeba, one of the tiny forms of protoplasmic life he was known to have studied. Also, he leaped into a hysteria of self-accusation. He had murdered two innocent people. The tragedy was his crime. He had drowned them in ooze. Ah, oh, God. Unfortunately for all concerned, Cranmer, dazed and indubitably stark and sane, chose to perform a strange travesty on fishing four miles to the west of his lodge on the further border of Moccasin Swamp. His clothing had been torn to shreds. His hat was gone and he was coated from head to foot with gluey mire. It was far from strange that the good folk of Shanksville, who never had glimpsed the eccentric millionaire, failed to associate him with Cranmer. They took him in, searched his pockets, finding no sign save an inordinate sum of money, and then put him under medical care. Two precious weeks elapsed before Dr. Quirk reluctantly acknowledged that he could do nothing more for this patient and notify the proper authorities. Then much more time was wasted, Hot April and half of still hotter May passed by before the loose ends were connected. Then it did little good to know that this raving unfortunate was Cranmer, or that the two persons of whom he shouted in disconnected delirium actually had disappeared. Alienists absolved him of responsibility. He was confined in a cell reserved for the violent. Meanwhile, strange things occurred back at the lodge, which now, for good and sufficient reason, was becoming known to dwellers of the woods as Dead House. Until one of the walls fell in, however, there had been no chance to see, unless one possessed the temerity to climb either one of the tall live oaks or mount the barrier itself. No doors or opening of any sort had been placed in that hastily constructed wall. By the time the western side of the wall fell, not a native for miles around but feared the spot far more than even the bottomless, snake-infested bogs which lay to the west and north. The single statement was all John Corliss Cranmer ever gave to the world. It proved sufficient. An immediate search was instituted. It showed that less than three weeks before the day of initial reckoning, his son and Peggy had come to visit him for the second time that winter, leaving Elsie in the company of the Daniels pair. They had rented a pair of Gordons for quail hunting and had gone out. That was the last anyone had ever seen of them. The backwoods negro who glimpsed them stalking a covey behind their two pointing dogs had known no more, even when sweated through twelve hours of third degree. Certain suspicious circumstances, having to do only with his regular pursuit of shinny transportation, had caused him to fall under suspicious at first. He was dropped. 
Two days later, the scientist himself was apprehended, a gibbering idiot who sloughed his pole holding on to the baited hook into a marsh where nothing save moccasins, an errant alligator, or amphibian life could have been snared. His mind was three-quarters dead. Cranmer then was in the slate of the dope fiend who rouses to a sitting position to ask seriously how many Bolshevists were killed by Julius Caesar before he was stabbed by Brutus, or why it was that Roller Canary sang only on Wednesday evenings. He knew that tragedy of the most sinister sort had stalked through his life, but little more at first. Later, the police obtained that one statement that he had murdered two human beings, but never could means or motive be established. Official guess as to the means was no more than wild conjecture. It mentioned enticing the victims to the noisome depths of Moccasin Swamp, there to let them flounder and sink. The two were his son and daughter-in-law, Lee and Peggy. Then awaking with suddenness to assault three attendants with incredible ferocity and strength, John Corliss Cranmer escaped from Elizabeth Ritter Hospital. How he hid how he managed to traverse 60-odd intervening miles and still balk detection remains a minor mystery to be explained only by the assumption that maniacal cunning sufficed to outwit saner intellects. Traverse those miles he did, though until I was fortunate enough to uncover evidence to this effect, it was supposed, generally, that he had made his escape as a stowaway on one of the banana boats, or had buried himself in some portion of the nearer woods where he was unknown. The truth ought to be welcome to householders of Shanksville, Burdett's Corners, and vicinage, those excusably prudent ones who to this day keep loaded shotguns handy and barricade their doors at nightfall. The first ten days of my investigation may be touched upon in brief. I made headquarters in Burdett's Corners and drove out each morning, carrying lunch and returning for my grits and piney woods pork or mutton before nightfall. My first plan had been to camp out at the edge of the swamp, for opportunity to enjoy the outdoors comes rarely in my direction. Yet after one cursory examination of the premises, I abandoned the idea. I did not want to camp alone there, and I am less superstitious than a real estate agent. It was, perhaps, psychic warning. More probably the queer, faint, salt odor as a fish left to decay, which hung about the ruin, made too unpleasant an impression upon my olfactory sense. I experienced a distinct chill every time the lengthening shadows caught me near Deadhouse. The smell impressed me. In newspaper reports of the case, one ingenious explanation had been worked out. To the rear of the spot where Dead House had stood, inside the wall, was a swampy hollow, circular in shape. Only a little real mud lay in the bottom of the bowl-like depression now, but one reporter on the staff of the Mobile Register guessed that during the tenancy of the lodge, it had been a fish pool. Drying up of the water had killed the fish, who now permeated the remnant of mud with this foul odor. The possibility that Cranmer had needed to keep fresh fish at hand for some of his experiments silenced the natural objection that in a country where every stream holds gar, pike, bass, catfish, and many other edible varieties, no one would dream of stocking a stagnant puddle. After tramping about the enclosure, testing the queerly brittle, desiccated top stratum of earth within, and speculating concerning the possible purpose of the wall, I cut off a long limb of chinaberry and probed the mud. One fragment of fish spine would confirm the guess of that imaginative reporter. I found nothing resembling a piscal skeleton, but established several facts. First, this mud crater had definite bottom only three or four feet below the surface of remaining ooze. Second, the fishy stench became stronger as I stirred. Third, at one time the mud, water, or whatever had comprised the balance of content had reached the rim of the bowl. The last showed by certain marks plain enough when the crusty, two-inch stratum of upper coating was broken away. It was puzzling. The nature of that thin, desiccated effluvium, which seemed to cover everything even to the lower foot or two of brick, came in next for inspection. It was strange stuff, unlike any earth I had ever seen, though undoubtedly some form of scum drained in from the swamp at the time of the river floods or cloudbursts which in this section are common enough in spring and fall, it crumbled beneath the fingers. When I walked over it, the stuff crunched hollowly. In fainter degree, it possessed the fishy odor also. I took some samples where it lay thickest upon the ground, and also a few where there seemed to be no more than a depth of a sheet of paper. Later, I would have a laboratory analysis made. 
apart from any possible bearing the stuff might have upon the disappearance of my three friends, I felt the tug of article interest, that wonder over anything strange or seemingly inexplicable which lends the hunt for fact a certain glamour and romance all its own. To myself, I was going to have to explain sooner or later just why this layer covered the entire space within the walls and was not perceptible anywhere outside. The enigma could wait, however. Or so I decided. Far more interesting were the traces of violence apparent on wall and what once had been a house. The latter seemed to have been ripped from its foundations by a giant hand, crushed out of semblance to a dwelling, and then cast in fragments about the base of wall, mainly on the south side where heaps of twisted, broken timbers lay in profusion. On the opposite side there had been such heaps once, but now only charred sticks, coated with that gray-black, omnipresent coat of desiccation, remained. These piles of charcoal had been sifted and examined most carefully by the authorities, as one theory had been advanced that Cranmer had burned the bodies of his victims, yet no sign whatever of human remains was discovered. The fire, however, pointed out one odd fact which controverted the reconstructions made by detectives months before. The latter, suggesting the dried scum to have drained in from the swamp, believed that the house timbers had floated out to the sides of the wall, there to arrange themselves in a series of piles. The absurdity of such a theory showed even more plainly by the fact that, if the scum had filtered through in such a flood, the timbers most certainly had been dragged into piles previously. Some had burned and the scum coated their charred surfaces. What had been the force which had torn the lodge to bits as if in spiteful fury? Why had the parts of the wreckage been burned, the rest to escape? Right here, I felt, was the keynote to the mystery. Yet I could imagine no explanation that John Corliss Cramner himself, physically sound, yet a man who for decades had led a sedentary life, could have accomplished such a destruction, unaided, was difficult to believe. I turned my attention to the wall, hoping for evidence which might suggest another theory. The wall had been made an example of the worst snide construction. Though little more than a year old, the parts left standing showed evidence that they had begun to decay the day the last brick was laid. The mortar had fallen from the interstices. Here and there a brick had cracked and dropped out. Fibrils of the climbing vines had penetrated crevices, working for early destruction. And one side already had fallen. It was here that the first glimmering suspicion of the terrible truth was forced upon me. The scattered bricks, even those which had rolled inward toward the gaping foundation ledge, had not been coated with scum. This was curious, yet it could be explained by surmise that the flood itself had undermined this weakest portion of the wall. I cleared away a mass of brick from the spot on which the structure had stood. To my surprise I found it exceptionally firm. Hard red clay lay beneath. The flood conception was faulty. Only some great force, exerted from inside or outside, could have wreaked such destruction. When careful measurement, analysis, and deduction convinced me, mainly from the fact that the lowermost layers of brick had all fallen outward, while the upper portions toppled in, I began to link up this mysterious and horrific force with the one that had rent the lodge asunder. It looked as though a typhoon or gigantic centrifuge had needed elbow room in ripping down the wooden structure, but I got nowhere with the theory, though in ordinary affairs I am called a man of two great imaginative tendencies. No less than three editors have cautioned me on this point. Perhaps it was the narrowing influence of great personal sympathy. Yes, and love. I make no excuses, though. Beyond a dim understanding that some terrific, implacable force must have made this spot its playground, I ended my ninth day of note-taking and investigation almost as much in the dark as I had been while a thousand miles away in Chicago. Then I started among the darkies and Cajuns. A whole day I listened to yarns of the days which preceded Cranmer's escape from Elizabeth Ritter Hospital, days in which furtive men sniffed poisoned air for miles around Dead House, finding the odor intolerable. Days in which it seemed none possessed nerve enough to approach close. Days when the most fanciful tales of medieval superstitions were spun. These tales I shall not give. The truth is incredible enough. At noon upon the eleventh day, I chanced upon Rory Pileron, a Cajun, and one of the least prepossessing of all with whom I had come in contact. Chanced, perhaps, is a bad word. I had listed every dweller in the woods within a five-mile radius. 
Rory was 16th on my list. I went to him only after interviewing all four of the crab years and two whole families of Pichons, and Rory regarded me with the utmost suspicion until I made him a present of the two quarts of shinny purchased of the Pichons. Because long practice had perfected me in the technique of seeming to drink another man's awful liquor, no, I'm not an absolute prohibitionist. Fine wine or twelve-year in-cask bourbon whiskey arouses my definite interest. I fooled Pilaren from the start. I shall omit preliminaries and leap to the first admission from him that he knew more concerning Deadhouse and its former inmates than any of the other darkies or Cajuns roundabout. But I ain't talking. Sacre, if I should open my gab, what might fly out? It is for keeping silent. You're damn right. I agreed. He was a wise man, educated to some extent in the queer schools and churches maintained exclusively by Cajuns in the depths of the woods, yet naive withal. We drank, and I never had to ask another leading question. That made him want to interest me, and the only extraordinary in this whole neck of the woods was the dead house. Three quarters of a pint of acrid, nauseous fluid, and he hinted darkly. A pint, and he told me something I could scarcely believe. Another half pint but I shall give his confession in condensed form. He had known Joe Sibley, the Octoroon chef, houseman, and valet who served Cranmer. Through Joe, Rory had furnished certain indispensables in way of food to the Cranmer household. At first, these saleable articles had been exclusively vegetable, white and yellow turnip, sweet potatoes, corn and beans, but later, meat. Yes, meat especially. Whole lambs, slaughtered and quartered the coarsest variety of piney woods pork and beef, all in immense quantity. In December of the fatal winter, Lee and his wife stopped down at the lodge for ten days or thereabouts. They were en route to Cuba at the time, intending to be away five or six weeks. Their original plan had been to wait over a day or so in the piney woods, but something caused an amendment to the scheme. The two dallied. Lee seemed to have become vastly absorbed in something, so much absorbed that it was only when Peggy insisted upon continuing their trip that he could tear himself away. It was during those ten days that he began buying meat. Meager bits of it at first. A rabbit, a pair of squirrels, or perhaps a few quail beyond the number he and Peggy shot. Rory furnished the game, thinking nothing of it except that Lee paid double prices, and insisted upon keeping the purchases secret from other members of the household. I'm putting it across on the governor, Rory he said once with a wink. Gonna give him the shock of his life, so you mustn't let on, even to Joe, about what I want you to do. Maybe it won't work out, but if it does, Dad'll have the scientific world at his feet. He doesn't blow his own horn anywhere near enough, you know. Rory didn't know. Hadn't a suspicion what Lee was talking about. Still, if this rich, young idiot wanted to pay him half dollar in good silver coin for a quail that anyone, himself included, could knock down with a five-cent shell, Rory was well satisfied to keep his mouth shut. Each evening he brought some of the small game, and each day Lee Cranmer seemed to have use for an additional quail or so. When he was ready to leave for Cuba, Lee came forward with the strangest of propositions. He fairly whispered his vehemence and desire for secrecy. He would tell Rory that he would pay the Cajun $500, half in advance and half at the end of five weeks when Lee himself would return from Cuba provided Rory agreed to adhere absolutely to a certain secret program. The money was more than a fortune to Rory. It was undreamt of affluence. The Cajun acceded. He was telling me, then, how old man had raised some kind of pet, Rory confided, and wanted to get shed of it. So he gave it to Lee, telling him to kill it. But Lee was sot on fooling him. What I ask you is, what kind of pet is it what lives down in the mud sinking and eats a cup of hogs every night? I couldn't imagine, so I pressed him for further details. Here, at last, was something which sounded like a clue. He really knew too little. The agreement with Lee provided that if Rory carried out the provisions exactly, he should be paid extra and at his exorbitant scale of all additional outlay when Lee returned. The young man gave him a daily schedule which Rory showed. Each evening he was to procure, slaughter, and cut up a definite and growing amount of meat. Every item was checked and I saw that they ran from five pounds up to forty. What in heaven's name did you do with it? I demanded, excited now and pouring him an additional drink for fear caution might return to him. Took it back through the brushes and slung it in the mud sink there, and something come up and drug it down. 
A gator? Diable, how should I know? It was dark. I wouldn't go close. He shuddered, and the fingers which lifted his glass shook with a sudden chill. Maybe you'd have done it, huh? Not me, though. The young fella told me to sling it in, and I slung it. A couple times I come around in the light, but there wasn't nothing there you could see. Just mud and some water. Maybe the thing didn't come out in daytimes. Perhaps not, I agreed, straining every mental recourse to imagine what Lee's sinister pet could have been. But you said something about two hogs a day? What did you mean by that? This paper, proof enough you're telling the truth so far, states on the 35th day you were to throw 40 pounds of meat, any kind, into the sink. Two hogs, even the Piney Woods variety, weigh a lot, more than 40 pounds. Then was after, after he come back. From this point onward, Rory's tail became more and more enmeshed in the vagaries induced by bad liquor. His tongue thickened. I shall give his story without attempt to reproduce further verbal barbarities or the occasional prodding I had to give in order to keep him from maundering into foolish jargon. Lee had paid munificently. His only objection to the manner in which Rory had carried out his orders was that the orders themselves had been deficient. The pet, he said, had grown enormously. It was hungry, ravenous. Lee himself had supplemented the fare with huge pails of scraps from the kitchen. From that day, Lee purchased from Rory whole sheep and hogs. The Cajun continued to bring the carcasses at nightfall, but no longer did Lee permit him to approach the pool. The young man appeared chronically excited. He had a tremendous secret, one the extent of which even his father did not guess, and one which would astonish the world. Only a week or two more, and he would spring it. First, he would have to arrange certain data. Then came the day when everyone disappeared from Dead House. Rory came around several times, but concluded that all of the occupants had folded tents and departed, doubtless taking their mysterious pet along. Only when he saw from a distance Joe, the octoroon servant returning along the road on foot toward the lodge, did his slow mental processes begin to ferment. That afternoon, Rory visited the strange place for the next to last time. He did not go to the lodge himself, and there were reasons. While still some hundreds of yards away from the place, a terrible sustained screaming reached his ears. It was faint, yet unmistakably, the voice of Joe. Throwing a pair of number two shells into the breech of his shotgun, Rory hurried on, taking his usual path through the brush at the back. He saw, and as he told me, even shinny drunkenness fled his chattering tones. Joe, the octoroon. Aye, he stood in the yard, far from the pool into which Rory had thrown the carcasses. And Joe could not move. Rory failed to explain in full, but something, a slimy, amorphous something, which glistened in the sunlight, already engulfed the man to his shoulders. Breath was cut off. Joe's contorted face writhed with horror and beginning suffocation. One hand, all that was free of the rest of him, beat feebly upon the rubbery, translucent thing that was engulfing his body. Then Joe sank from sight. Five days of liquored indulgence passed before Rory, along in his shaky cabin, convinced himself that he had seen a fantasy born of alcohol. He came back the last time to find a high wall of brick surrounding the lodge and including the pool of mud into which he had thrown the meat. While he hesitated, circling the place without discovering an opening, which he would not have dared to use, had he even found it, a crashing, tearing of timbers and persistent sound of awesome destruction came from within. He swung himself into one of the oaks near the wall, and he was just in time to see the last supporting stanchions of the lodge give way outward. The whole structure came apart. The roof fell in. It seemed to move after it had fallen. Logs of wall, deserted layers of plywood in the grasp of the shearing machine. That was all. Soddenly intoxicated now, Rory mumbled more phrases, giving me the idea that on another day when he became sober once more, he might add to his statements. But I, numbed to the soul, scarcely cared. If that which he related was true, what nightmare of madness must have been consummated here? I could vision some things now which concerned Lee and Peggy. Horrible things. Only remembrance of Elsie kept me faced forward in the search, for now it seemed almost that the handiwork of a madman must be preferred to what Rory claimed to have seen. What had been that sinister translucent thing? That glistening thing which jumped upward about a man, smothering, engulfing. 
Queerly enough, though such a theory as came most easily to my mind, now would have outraged reason in me if suggested concerning total strangers. I asked myself only what details of Rory's revelation had been exaggerated by fright and fumes of liquor. And as I sat on the creaking bench in his cabin, staring unseeing as he lurched down to the floor, fumbling with a lockbox of green tin which lay under his cot, and muttering, the answer to all my questions lay within reach. It was not until the next day, however, that I made the discovery. Heavy of heart, I had re-examined the spot where the lodge had stood, then made my way to the Cajun's cabin again, seeking sober confirmation of what he had told me during intoxication. In imagining that such a spree for Rory would be ended by a single night, however, I was mistaken. He lay sprawled almost as I had left him. Only two factors were changed. No shinny was left, and lying open with its miscellaneous contents strewed about was the tin box. Rory somehow had managed to open it with the tiny key still clutched in his hand. Concern for his safety alone was what made me notice the box. It was a receptacle for small fishing tackle of the sort carried here and there by any sportsman. Tangles of Dowagiac minnows, spool hooks ranging in size to silver-backed number eights, three reels still carrying line of different weights, spinners, Casting plus wobblers, floating baits were spilled out upon the rough plank flooring where they might snag Rory badly if he rolled. I gathered them, intending to save him an accident. With the miscellaneous assortment in my hands, however, I stopped dead. Something had caught my eye, something lying flush with the bottom of the lockbox. I stared, and then swiftly tossed the hooks and other impediments upon the table. What I had glimpsed there in the box was a loose-leaf notebook, the sort used for recording laboratory data, and Rory scarcely could read, let alone write. Feverishly, a riot of recognition, surmise, hope, and fear bubbling in my brain, I grabbed the book and threw it open. At once I knew that this was the end. The pages were scribbled in pencil, but the handwriting was that precise chirography I knew as belonging to John Corliss Cranmer, the scientist. Could he not have obeyed my instructions? Oh God, this... These were the words at top of the first page which met my eye. Because knowledge of the circumstances, the relation of which I pried out of the reluctant Rory only some days later when I had him in Mobile as a police witness for the sake of my friend's vindication, is necessary to understanding. I shall interpolate. Rory had not told me everything. On his late visit to the vicinage of Dead House, he saw more. A crouching figure, seated Turk fashion on top of the wall, appeared to be writing industriously. Rory recognized the man as Cranmer, yet did not hail him. He had no opportunity. Just as the Cajun came near, Cranmer rose, thrust the notebook which had rested across his knees into the box. Then he turned, tossed outside the wall both the locked box and a ribbon to which was attached the key. Then his arms raised toward heavens. For five seconds he seemed to invoke the mercy of power beyond all of man's scientific prying. And finally he leaped. Inside. Rory did not climb to investigate. He knew that directly below this portion of wall lay the mud sink into which he had thrown the chunks of meat. This is a true transcription of the statement I inscribed, telling the sequence of actual events at Dead House. The original of the statement now lies in the archives of the detective department. Cranmer's notebook, though written in a precise hand, yet betrayed the man's insanity by incoherence and frequent repetitions. My statement has been accepted now both by alienists and by detectives who had entertained different theories in respect to the case. It quashes the noisome hints and suspicions regarding three of the finest Americans who ever lived, and also one queer supposition dealing with supposed criminal tendencies in poor Joe, the Octoroon. John Corliss Cranmer went insane for sufficient cause. As readers of popular fiction know well, Lee Cranmer's forte was the writing of what is called among fellows in his craft, pseudoscientific theory. In plain words, this means a yarn based upon solid fact in the field of astronomy, chemistry, anthropology, or whatnot, which carries to logical conclusion improved theories of men who devote their lives to searching out further nadirs of fact. In certain fashion, these men are allies of science. Often they visualize something which has not been imagined even by the best of men from whom they secure data, thus opening new horizons of possibility. In a large way, Jules Verne was one of these men in his day. Lee Cranmer bade fair to carry on the work in worthy fashion, work taken up for a period by an Englishman named Wells, but abandoned for stories of a different, 
and, in my humble opinion, less absorbing, type. Lee wrote three novels, all published which dealt with such subjects. Two of the three secured from his father's labors, and the other speculating upon the discovery and possible uses of interatomic energy. Upon John Corliss Cranmer's return from Prague that fatal winter, the father informed Lee that a greater subject than any with which the young man had dealt now could be tapped. Cranmer, Sr., had devised a way in which the limiting factors in protozoic life and growth could be nullified. In time, and with cooperation of biologists who specialized upon karyokinesis and embryology of higher forms, he hoped, to put the theory in pragmatic terms, to be able to grow swine the size of elephants, quail or woodcock with breasts from which a hundred weight of white meat could be cut away, and steers whose dehorned heads might butt at the third story of a skyscraper. Such result would revolutionize the methods of food supply, of course. It also would hold out hope for all undersized specimens of humanity, provided only that if factors inhibiting growth could be deleted, some methods of stopping gianthood also could be developed. Cranmer the Elder, through use of an undescribed, in the notebook, growth medium of which one constituent was agar-agar and the use of radium emanations, had succeeded in bringing about apparently unrestricted growth to the paramecium protozoan, certain of the vegetable growths, among which were bacteria, and in the amorphous cell of protoplasm known as the amoeba, the last a single cell containing only a nucleolus, nucleus, and a space known as the contractile vacuole, which somehow aided in throwing off particles impossible to assimilate directly. This point may be remembered in respect to the piles of lumber near the outside walls surrounding Dead House. When Lee Cranmer and his wife came south to visit, John Corliss Cranmer showed his son an amoeba, normally an organism visible under a low-power microscope, which he had absolved from natural growth inhibitions. This amoeba, a rubbery, amorphous mass of protoplasm, was the size then of a large beef liver. It could have been held in two cupped hands placed side by side. How large could it grow? asked Lee, wide-eyed and interested. Well, so far as I know, answered his father, there's no limit now. It might, if it got food enough, grow to be as big as the Masonic Temple, but take it out and kill it. Destroy the organism utterly, burning the fragments, else there is no telling what might happen. The amoeba, as I have explained, reproduces by simple division. Any fragment remaining might be dangerous. Lee took the rubbery translucent giant cell, but he did not obey orders. Instead of destroying it as his father had directed, Lee thought out a plan. Suppose he should grow this organism to tremendous size. Suppose, when the tale of his father's accomplishment were spread, an amoeba of many tons weight could be shown in evidence. Lee, of somewhat sensational cast of mind, determined instantly to keep secret the fact that he was not destroying the organism, but encouraging its further growth thought of possible peril never crossed his mind. He arranged to have the thing fed, allowing for normal increase of size in an abnormal thing. It fooled him only by growing much more rapidly. When he came back from Cuba, the amoeba practically filled the whole of the mud sink hollow. He had to give it much greater supplies. The giant cell came to absorb as much as two hogs in a single day. During daylight, while hunger still was appeased, it never emerged, however. That remained for the time that it could secure no more food near at hand to satisfy its ravenous and increasing appetite. Only instinct for the sensational kept Lee from telling Peggy, his wife, all about the matter. Lee hoped to spring a coup which would immortalize his father and surprise his wife terrifically. Therefore, he kept his own counsel and made bargains with the Cajun, Rory, who supplied food daily for the shapeless monster of the pool. The tragedy itself came suddenly and unexpectedly. Peggy feeding the two Gordon setters that Lee and she used for quail hunting, was in the lodge yard before sunset. She romped alone as Lee himself was dressing. Of a sudden, her screams cut the air. Without her knowledge, ten-foot pseudopods, those flowing tentacles of protoplasm sent forth by the sinister occupant of the pool, slid out and around her potayed ankles. For a moment at first she did not understand. Then, the horrid suspicion of truth, her cries rent the air. Lee, at that time struggling to lace a pair of high shoes, straightened, paled, and grabbed a revolver as he dashed out. In another room, a scientist, absorbed in his note-taking, glanced up, frowned, and then, recognizing the voice, 
shed his white gown and came out. He was too late to do aught but gasp with horror. In the yard, Peggy was half engulfed in a squamous, rubbery something which at first he could not analyze. Lee, his boy, was fighting with the sticky folds and slowly, surely losing his own grip upon the earth. John Corliss Cranmer was by no means a coward. He stared, cried aloud, then ran indoors, seizing the first two weapons which came to hand, a shotgun and hunting knife which lay in sheath in a cartridged belt across hook of the hall tree. The knife was ten inches in length and razor keen. Cranmer rushed out again. He saw an indecent fluid, something which as yet he had not had time to classify, lumped into a six-foot-high center before his very eyes. It looked like one of the microorganisms he had studied, one grown to frightful dimensions. An amoeba. There, some minutes suffocated in the rubbery folds, yet still apparent beneath the glistening ooze of this monster, were two bodies. They were dead. He knew it. Nevertheless, he attacked the flowing senseless monster with his knife. Shot would do no good, and he found that even the deep, terrific slashes made by his knife closed together in a moment and healed. The monster was invulnerable to ordinary attack. A pair of pseudopods sought out his ankles, attempting to bring him low. Both of these he severed and escaped. Why did he try? He did not know. The two whom he had sought to rescue were dead buried under folds of this horrid thing he knew to be his own discovery and fabrication. Then it was that revulsion and insanity came upon him. There ended the story of John Corliss By Cranmer, Anthony M. save Rudd. for one hastily scribbled paragraph, evidently written at the time Rory had seen him atop the wall. May we not supply with assurance the intervening steps? Cranmer was known to have purchased a whole pen of hogs a day or two following the tragedy. These animals were never seen again. During the time the wall was being constructed, it is not reasonable to assume that he fed the giant organism within to keep it quiet. His scientist brain must have visualized clearly the havoc and horror which could be wrought by the loathsome thing if it were ever driven to hunger to flow away from the lodge and prey upon the countryside. With the wall once in place, he evidently figured that starvation or some other means which he could supply would kill the thing. One of the means had been made by setting fire to several piles of the disgorged timbers, Probably this had no effect whatsoever. The amoeba was to accomplish still more destruction. In the throes of hunger, it threw its gigantic formless strength against the walls from the inside. Then every edible morsel within was house assimilated. The logs, rafters, and other fragments being worked out through the contractile vacuole. During some of its last struggles, undoubtedly, the side wall of brick was weakened. Not to collapse, however, until the giant amoeba no longer could take advantage of the breach. In final death lassitude, the amoeba stretched itself out in a thin layer over the ground. There it succumbed, though there is no means of estimating how long a time intervened. The last paragraph in Cranmer's notebook, scrawled so badly that it is possible some words I have not deciphered correctly, reads as follows. In my work I have found the means of creating a monster. The unnatural thing in turn has destroyed my work and those whom I held dear. It is in vain that I assure myself of innocence of spirit. Mine is the crime of presumption. Now, as expedition, worthless though that may be, I give myself. It is better not to think of that last leap and the struggle of an insane man in the grip of the dying monster. The End End of Ooze This was recorded by Mr. Mike 79, also known as Mike Golchinski, from Lowell, Michigan, United States of America. Thank you. <laughs>